Colorado hasn't been promoting the new Call 988 for mental health help until now, until so many callers have one thing worrying. I would say probably the vast majority of callers that we get, it's, it's on their minds. Grocery store CEOs say their merger won't lead to store closures or layoffs in Colorado. Deeper expert analysis of the indictment of those Clear Creek County deputies suggests that America may have never seen a police accountability case like this one. There are now 20 people running for mayor of Denver. Tonight, we kick off our series, hearing from the several people in Denver not running for mayor. A special education teacher is building a sensory room for her students, in part thanks to you. In this season of gratitude, she has a bunch for all of you watching next. The Club Q shooting is changing the way Colorado is encouraging people to get mental health help. National Crisis Hotline hasn't been promoted or used much since it was launched earlier this year. Then local providers found value in its resources. Here's Mark Salinger. Colorado Crisis Services, this is Kat. May I ask who's calling? The calls come in constantly. Are you experiencing any suicidal ideations today? Answered by people who are here to help. Right now we're standing in the call center for Colorado Crisis Services and Colorado's 988 crisis line. After a tragedy like what we saw at Club Q, Sherry Skelding sees callers mentioning the news more often. Well, it is hard. She's the clinical director at Rocky Mountain Crisis Partners, which operates the hotlines. The vast majority of callers that we get, it's, it's on their minds. The shooting at Club Q is now changing how they're encouraging people to get help. In Colorado, the number to call for crisis services has long been 844-493-8255. The calls are answered by people who work here, who can direct people to local services. The change in the last um, week or so is that we've started to talk and, and, and bring the resource of 988 um, more publicly. Last July, the National Suicide Prevention Hotline launched its new 988 number. It hasn't been promoted much here and only sees a fourth of the call volume right now in the state compared to the Colorado Crisis Services line. But on that 988 line, Callers have the option to get specific help from people in the LGBTQ community. It's proved helpful this week. That option on the 988 to press 3 really gets you to someone who specializes in giving support to LGBTQ individuals. Specific help in a time when lots are struggling to make sense of what happened. Now, there are some problems with the 988 number, which is why it hasn't really been promoted much here in Colorado. For example, let's say someone recently moved here from California and still has a California phone number. When they call that national hotline 988 number, they'll be routed to a call center in California. That makes it harder to get access to local resources that people like Colorado Crisis Services can provide. It's a useful distinction, though, for people to know what they're getting if they call those different numbers. How does, how does this work when there's like a mass tragedy like this? Are the calls coming in at once? Do they kind of dribble in over weeks? How does that go? Yeah, unfortunately, we've seen far too many of these in Colorado, and it's kind of a misconception that they're just bombarded with a ton of phone calls right after something like this. The people at Colorado Crisis Services tell me that it usually happens almost months later, kind of after the holidays. They're already preparing like February, March to see an increase in calls. Wow. All right, Mark Salinger, thank you. I want to bring back the specific numbers that Mark showed. There is help available, and you have options. You can call Colorado Crisis Services, or, or that's the number on the screen, 1-844-493-8255, or you can text the word TALK to 38255, or you can call 998, the new National Suicide Prevention Line. That's the one that has the specific resources for the LGBTQ community. The Club Q shooting came up on the floor of the U.S. Senate today before the vote to create federal protections for same-sex marriage. Colorado's Democratic Senator Michael Bennett acknowledged the five people killed. He talked about Club Q being a safe space for the LGBTQ community. But Bennett said even with the Senate today passing those protections for same-sex marriage, House expected to do the same, the threat of violence still there. No one enjoying a night with their friends and their family should have to go into combat mode in the United States of America. That is not the country that I grew up in. It is our country today. Colorado is hurting. We are tired of this, Madam President. For more than two decades, we've had to grieve over one incident after another. The bill passed by the Senate, every Democrat plus 12 Republicans, would require all states to legally recognize LGBTQ marriages performed in other states. Democrats try to get this bill through the House and to the President before Republicans take control of the House come January. Club Q was planning a special event for the day after the shooting on Transgender Day of Remembrance, a day set aside to remember trans people who have been killed because of who they are. 
When it comes to violence against the LGBTQ community, trans people are often particular targets. Two of the people killed at Club Q, Kelly Loving and Daniel Aston, were trans. The trans community lives with the knowledge that there are people out there who are intent on harming them. A UCLA study found that those who identify as trans are four times more likely to be the victim of a violent crime than their cisgender counterparts. The study says 25% of those victims believe it was in fact a hate crime. The Transgender Center of the Rockies offers counseling for transgender and non-binary people across our state, and stories of violence are common. I wish I could say that was uncommon. It's not, um, especially for a trans woman. Um, those rates are worse. A trans woman of color, those rates are even worse. Um, and it's a it's a dangerous, um, unsafe world. <laughs> it's I challenging. Um, I think um, what folks fail to understand is how constant um, the underlying worry and fear can be. The progressive nonprofit, the Human Rights Campaign, keeps count of the number of transgender people believed to be killed each year. So far in 2022, 34 people. Though the HRC says the crimes are often underreported where the victim's gender is not accurately reported. So there is rare, and then there's unprecedented. We've been telling you how rare it is that a Clear Creek County deputy remotely supervising an incident was criminally charged for the shooting death of Christian Glass over the summer. Experts in police procedure and the law told our Steve Sager today there might not be a single other case like this. Keep your windows down because we're here to help you. What we saw months later, Sergeant Kyle Gould was allegedly watching in real time. Are you on live stream right now? Yeah. Okay. We hear Deputy Andrew Buen and his partner talk about a live stream on the body camera video the night 22 year old Christian Glass called 911 for help. The night Deputy Buen eventually broke his window, shot him with beanbag rounds, tased him, and then shot him. No need to show you all of that again. The grand jury indictment argues their supervisor, Sergeant Gould, was watching a live feed of their body cameras. In this case, there does seem to be a relatively clear argument to be made that it was the decision of Sergeant Gould, who was not at the scene, that led to the death. Ian Farrell is a law professor at DU. He says the fact that Gould could see it all, including how Glass was acting that night, explains why he was charged. The fact that there was a live feed going to the decision maker, and so um, there was sufficient information available uh, to him that a reasonable person would have known making the decision to take this person out of the car would create a substantial risk of uh, of him ending up hurt or even killed. According to the grand jury's indictment, okay. Buen calls Gould on the scene. Yeah, for personal conversation. And mutes his body camera while they talk. When he sets his phone down, you can see it's Gould on the other end of the line. It is extremely rare, uh, virtually unheard of. Uh, in the law enforcement world. Ed Obayashi is a sheriff's deputy and police tactics expert in California. You know, in my experience, uh, the officers don't call for permission to break in, as I mentioned, to use force. The indictment alleges after the phone call, the decision is made. Gould's already given us authorization. We're just oh, trying everything on. we can. I'll double check. I'll send 5116. You have a plus pop in this window. Ewan checks with Gould on the radio again. Then breaks the window. So far. No, 16, we'll be forced, you? The beginning of the end. Now, neither Obayashi nor Farrell could recall a case where a police supervisor who was off the scene used a live stream to monitor a situation, and that may be key in this case, Farrell says. Gould is charged with criminally negligent homicide for authorizing that forced entry. Buen, who is on scene, is charged with second degree murder. But the fact that this was watched on a body camera live stream, something that I think you and I didn't even realize you could do, yeah. uh, it, it might come in key in this case. We'll have to see what happens in court. What do the experts tell you about when you would call a supervisor to get an approval on something? So Ed Obayashi says, yes, in these cases where it's urgent, you really rely on the officer to make that decision. But in a case like a welfare check, like say your neighbor calls and says, I haven't seen this person in three days, but their car's out front and their door's locked and I'm not sure they're okay. That's when a police officer who's going in to check out might call a supervisor and say, hey, what do you think about this? Should we break this door open, see if the person inside is okay? That's the type of typical situation you'd have. But Obayashi said this type of situation, he's really ever seen anyone ever ask for permission to break into a car with someone who's non compliant inside. Again, only found out about this because the family questioned the narrative put out by law enforcement. Absolutely. Thank you, Steve.
The people running King Supers and Safeway tell Congress that grocery shoppers have nothing to worry about if they merge. Some of their employees say they need to succeed by staying separate. Schools in rural Colorado aren't always able to complete projects due to a lack of funds. A few of them got that money and want to thank you for it. Next. It wasn't like the heads of Kroger and Albertsons were going to go before Congress today and be like, yes, merging could be a disaster for customers. So it's no surprise that they defended the proposed deal today. It was surprising to hear the promises they made about jobs and grocery prices. Kroger, which owns King Supers, and Albertsons, which owns Safeway, want to combine in 2024. Kroger CEO told Congress today that he will not close any stores. Senators were skeptical of that promise. They pointed to Albertsons' 2015 purchase of Safeway, which led to dozens of failed store divestitures, where Albertsons unsuccessfully tried to spin off stores to avoid closures. Then there were representatives from unions representing thousands of grocery store workers. They did not buy this promise to keep stores open. We want and need both Kroger and Albertsons to thrive and be successful. They are important businesses that provide jobs, food, and medicine for our communities and business for local suppliers. We just want them to thrive as separate entities and call on the FTC to hear our concerns and stop the merger. Today, the heads of Kroger and Albertsons told uh, legislators that they believe that streamlining the supply chain could lower prices, increase competition. There's another witness that came before the same committee, an antitrust researcher with the nonprofit Consumer Reports, who said it's too early to tell if that's the case, especially considering how many stores they own in some markets like Colorado. That researcher pointed to Kroger's 2021 annual report, which listed Albertsons as the main competitor in nearly a third of its top 49 markets. Next is covering the race for Denver mayor. There are currently 20 candidates in the race. So to simplify things for voters, we are going to try to profile each person in Denver who isn't running for mayor. Jared Lunar is not running for Denver mayor. He lives in Central Park. He's an energy attorney. He thinks someone with more leadership experience should be mayor. So we're asking each person we can find who's not running for Denver mayor what that next mayor should do. Jared Lunar says he wants the city to better balance big long-term goals with the basics, like properly picking up trash and keeping rec centers open. Denver has a lot of really lofty, ambitious goals that, that the city has set for itself. Things like, you know, eliminating greenhouse gas emissions by 2040, eliminating traffic deaths by 2030. But, you know, if you look at some of the kind of day to day operations of the city, it, it seems that the city's really struggling to do those things well. Fair point. Our interviews with some of the 20 people who are running for Denver mayor are on the next YouTube page. If you live in Denver and you are not running for mayor, but you're passionate about something with the city, email us at next at 9news.com. All right, well, that snow has moved out, but I do have some totals for you. Around the front range, Marshall got five and a half inches of snow, just over five inches in Greeley. Ken Carroll saw almost four and a half inches, almost four inches reported in Loveland, Denver International Airport at just under two inches there. So I separated front range snow totals from mountain snow totals so everyone gets a fair shot, but we saw ten and a half inches at Mount Zirkle in Gold, and uh, Glendevy and Longs Peak saw nine inches along with Green Mountain Reservoir, seven and a half reported at Cameron Pass and Meeker Park. So so we got those higher totals, of course, in the high country, specifically northern mountain ranges there. But all of that has moved on out. Skies are clearing. We're at 16 degrees, but staying very cold. With winds coming in from the east at 7 miles per hour, it feels closer to 6 degrees out there. Now, we do have a few avalanche warnings still in effect. They've been expanded to last until tomorrow. This is going to be Elk Mountains and West Elk Mountains. We're going to continue to watch for a high avalanche danger there, especially in the backcountry areas. But as we take a look at our HD Doppel radar, most of that system has already pushed its way on out of Colorado, so we're going to continue to see clearing skies throughout the evening. So these lows will drop pretty low. We'll see those uh, lower teens, single digits in some areas. It's going to feel like the single digits with a little bit of a breeze kicking in, mostly clear skies, calm tonight. We have another cold day in store for tomorrow. Despite all of that sunshine, temperatures will max out in the upper 30s, so make sure you stay bundled up despite all of the sunshine we're going to see tomorrow. And then we start to rebound very quickly. By Thursday, we're in the mid-50s. We stay in the mid-50s for Friday. We drop down just a tad Saturday with those seasonal temperatures in the upper 40s, and then we're back in the 50s by the beginning of next week.
Small rural schools across Colorado struggle to provide the same educational experience as bigger, better funded schools. So it's a real celebration when teachers can check things off their wish list. Next. Colorado's small school districts face some tough choices. They don't always have the funding to offer everything that large districts can offer. So in comes the Nathan Yip Foundation, Colorado-based nonprofit that helps small schools check stuff off their wish list. $95,000 is going out the door to help 49 teachers with some new projects. Well, my name is Jill Hinwood, and I'm the executive director of the Nathan Yip Foundation. So the Nathan Yip Foundation supports rural Colorado education, um, K-12 education. The word of thanks funding that we received was for our Rural Teachers Grant um, program, which we just started this year. We were able to fund nearly $100,000 worth of projects. My name is Jen Leslie. I'm a special education teacher at Upper Blue Elementary, and I work with um, students in all grades, kinder through fifth. So what we'd like to create here at our school is a sensory room in order to give some of our special education kids and maybe others who might need it, who aren't on um, individualized education plans as well. It's something that's really gonna support their, their well-being and help them regulate their emotions and their bodies and take those breaks when needed. We hopefully have started something both where, you know, people who are interested in supporting teachers, this is a good way for them to do it um, by donating to the Nathan Yip Foundation and then, and then sending that money out directly to teachers and schools based on their needs. In September, your word of thanks donations raised more than $32,000 to supplement that work by the Nathan Yip Foundation. Those are real projects that are being completed thanks to your help. Chemistry lab in Cotopaxi, a kiln for art students in Joe's, rolling carts for a roving music teacher in Custer County. Real donations with real impact for our neighbors. You're close to raising $10 million since 2020. Your feedback about the crowded race for Denver mayor next. Feedback on the launch of our series interviewing Denverites who are not among the 20 people running for mayor and what they want to see out of the city. Trish writes to us, my main issue priority is finding more candidates for mayor like that. Uh, Garrett says not being Hancock goes a long way for me. That is ice cold. Man is on the way out and you're doing that to him. Okay. Adam writes, so I really want to talk to you about this, but I also kind of want to run for mayor and now I'm torn on, on what I want to do. And the rules on this are very simple. All right. There's 20 people run for mayor. There might be 25 or 30 by the time everybody's done filling the field while they talk among themselves and start to figure things out. We're going to talk to actual real people among the couple who are not running for mayor to figure out what should be on the table. Email us next at 9news.com. You have to live in Denver for this. That's the whole idea. And you cannot run for mayor. You can't come on and then talk to us and then run for mayor later. That's, that's against the rules. The rules are very clear. See you next time.